it turns out that there was a meeting uh, call, convened by the World Health Organization in February uh, with virtually all the major big tech players that we're now familiar with, where they, the WHO initially discussed the need to control information about this pandemic. Of course, we now know that this is one of the uh, characteristics that went into the planning for Event 201 was how to control information. So in retrospect, you know, none of us, Event 201, I had never heard of Event 201 at the time. Right. Uh, none of us really had that context. Now it's in, in retrospect that we look back, we see that there was planning for how to implement censorship and, and these uh, deploy these other kinds of strategies. But I think it's important to remember that there's, and in the book we have the documentation about this, that there was a WHO initiative in February of 2020, a time when the Trump administration was still largely in denial that this represented a major bio threat. And then shortly thereafter, there was another meeting convened in the White House with Amazon and others, uh, including Washington Post, and Washington Post covered it, um, uh, in which uh, the strategy for uh, censorship, essentially, I don't know what else to call it, was uh, actively discussed um, together with big tech and big tech was recruited. Now we know uh, that through, you know, thanks to, I think it was the Blazes uh, Freedom of Information Act, we now know about the billion dollars expended by our government to promote whatever messaging um, that they, uh, you know, we have yet to discover what that messaging was uh, in coordination with tech. And I look forward to Jeff Landry's uh, lawsuit um, in which he's uh, suing the government and Facebook for uh, collusion on this censorship and information control. And I think when we get to discovery, we're going to learn all kinds of stuff that we probably didn't want to know, but we kind of need to. I wonder if it will have the, the impact that it should. I, I find that there's so much shocking information that we're just inured to it. And, and if we realize the implications, we would be... Um, we would be motivated to do something because they are dire. So as you know, since we spoke, um, I've spent a fair amount of time with this interesting guy um, from uh, named Matthias Desmet, this mm -hmm. interesting yes. academic uh, that I ran into many months ago from a podcast and have developed a fairly close friendship. And we spent time in Spain together. And um, we, we cut podcasts fairly frequently. So uh, Matthias in addition to his uh, insights in his upcoming English version of his book, um, uh, The Psychological Basis of Totalitarianism, uh, also is writing another book, and he, we continue to kind of develop those ideas and talk about it. One of the things that he points out is that only about 10% of the population really wants freedom. Um, the majority of the population in his assessment as a professional, I mean, this is what he does, uh, study crowds and crowd behavior. The majority of the population wants to be told what to do. And one of the core tenets in authoritarianism that's been documented, you know, for decades now, Hannah Arendt and Gustave Le Bon, et cetera, um, is that um, if, if one is going to choose, if, if, if there is a desire to implement a totalitarian structure, um, the best leadership strategy is to be very domineering. People seem to want to have an authoritarian leader. That's why authoritarianism and totalitarianism always come together like this. One of the things that he, he and I are talking about a lot more recently is that totalitarianism, we, we often think, well, it's going to be like Stalin or it's going to be like right. Hitler, right? Each time it manifests in subtly different ways. And uh, one of the ways that I think we're seeing this one develop is a way that was predicted a few years ago, um, inverse totalitarianism. We have effectively this fusion of corporate interests and the bureaucracy, the entrenched bureaucracy, which is what makes it inverted. It's not the elected political leaders or the appointed political leaders or whatever the, you know, typically the, the in, yeah. a, in a totalitarian structure, you have a small number of leaders at the summit um, that function as the political elite. 
But what we have, I think, growing here in the United States, and really, if you think about the World Economic Forum, it's kind of like that too, is you have these bureaucratic functionaries that uh, represent a, a more subtle, quiet, um, uh, established leadership that are acting in uh, unilateral um, authoritarian, totalitarian fashion, but they they are much less visible except for folks like you and me that are living in the moment and obsessing over it. Well, I, I am very cautious about imagining that I know more than I do about what is actually driving. I think we can feel the force that is arrayed against us. We can say something about how powerful it is, what kinds of tools it has at its disposal. We can say a little bit about um, the fact that it is not, it is at least not entirely a conspiracy, that there is at least a component of it that is evolved, that is emergent. Um, but I do not know to the extent that it behaves like an inverted totalitarian state. I don't know that it isn't a cryptic traditional one right, where we can't see the connections. And I'm especially cautious about it because I think its relationship to nation states is increasingly, um, uh, it's, an, it's a constraint that it must deal with. The fact that we still believe that we function in nations is uh, real and it has an impact. But for example, the apparent agreement amongst the Five Eyes countries to, well, my government can't invade my privacy, but there's no, yeah. yeah, but the British government can apparently invade my privacy and the American government can ask them to do it, right? Obviously, that is a violation of the spirit of the Bill of Rights, <clears throat> but the fact that we know that it takes place and that we know that these alliances exist and that we're not allowed to check in on them and that, you know, I'll go back to the issue of, in the U.S., it is literally true that the executive branch, because it decides someday that you've crossed the line that it has outlined without any ability to question it, can decide that you can no longer avail yourself of, for example, a court in which you might be able to say, I am not a terrorist and, you know, show me the evidence that I am. That court doesn't exist because you're not even allowed to know that it's been designated. So the point is that structure, to the extent that some structure can un-American me. It can take away my American rights, right? And then expose me to who knows what uh, that is decided at a global level, right? And, and we should probably at least touch on the fact that, you know, either this treaty with the WHO, um, which uh, many of us regard as a serious threat to sovereignty, this treaty that is supposed to provide a mechanism for managing a global pandemic. And I think all of us would agree that, you know, we're, if we had good governance globally, we would like somebody in a position to do rational things above the level of nations because these pathogens do jump borders. But I don't think anybody who's been paying attention wants any governmental structure that exists on earth today empowered to do these kinds of things because they obviously can't be trusted. I guess I've tripped over that line again. Um, but I don't know. I don't know what we're up against, and um, I, I'm afraid of assuming we know more than we do because it will cause us to make errors in fighting it. Fair enough. Um, I I I'm a little further along in the uh, spectrum. Uh, I'm choosing those words carefully. <laughs> um, uh, um, some might say I'm quite farther along in the spectrum, uh, whatever that spectrum is. Uh, right. So the pandemic treaty. Um, first off, we, we need to own, acknowledge that there is no treaty between the United States government and the World Health Organization. There's an agreement. Um, uh, we've agreed to fund them. We've agreed to engage and participate with them. But we do not have a treaty that has been reviewed by the uh, Senate and yeah. approved. Um, second point, I think what you're talking, because there is a treaty on the table. Yeah. Um, in addition to that treaty, there is the modification of the international health regulations, which is basically a, a modification of the, um, we can call it operating principles of the World Health Organization um, that was uh, submitted, I think it was January 28th, by our Health and Human Services 
which is the document that currently seems to have most folks wound up, and I think is what you're referring to. Yep. So, so these are um, uh, modifications to what are functionally operating procedures uh, that they call the international health regulations that um, uh, we're proposing that create a path that would allow the director general, currently Mr. Tedros, uh, to um, unilaterally uh, implement, uh, de declare a public health emergency for any reason. Um, and it's been pointed out, you know, one hot button is it could be for gun violence. A case could be made that we have an epidemic of gun violence in the United States, which is compromising public health. That case can well be made, has been made multiple times. Um, we could say that we have an epidemic of depression or anxiety. Those are all true. Mm -hmm. We do have those things. Um, uh, and uh, or, or it could be because of monkeypox, just pulling a pathogen out of the hat for some reason. Um, uh, in, in the determination uh, under these regulations would be made unilaterally by the director general um, based on uh, non-transparent sources, so they could be from anywhere. It could be Bill Gates calls him up and says, "Hey, we need a right. we we need a public health emergency," um, and uh, it would convey powers to um, make recommendations which nation states would have to respond to within forty eight hours. And if they did not comport with those regulations, it would authorize WHO and through it that the United Nations to implement sanctions such as, for instance, we've seen with Russia regarding the Ukrainian situation. So it, it, this pathway does not require uh, Senate uh, concurrence. It's not a treaty based um, and, and it's uh, ostensibly based in international law um, and sets a precedent of a unelected, um, uh, a uh, well, he's elected, sort of. He was elected without opposition by unanimity for his uh, recent re-election, uh, the director general, right? Um, to uh, implement uh, policies and practices that our government had no control over. Right, but I would just point out, this is the same story that I already told about um, the Department of Homeland Security. The Bingo. Idea the idea is there are supposed to be checks that prevent you from making a law that says, actually, at my sole discretion, I can declare you a so-and-so. And then having declared you a so-and-so. Oh, you're, you're precisely right. right? I agree. This is the same thing. And so I think the, the problem is it's very hard to, you know, it's very hard to imagine exactly how it would go down that the who is going to be dictating that we must impose mandates, right? It's very abstract. But the point is, once you've built that mechanism, it that can be at deployed at any point. At any it, point, it, yeah. It, it precisely illuminates and, and illustrates the point you made at the beginning, uh, which is this edifice has been built around us. Um, at, and at any point, the key can be turned, which makes it the sort of Damocles. It's always hanging over our head. And all they have to do is choose to cut the cord and it'll cut our neck off, metaphorically. Um, uh, and so that, and I think this is a key idea that you're drilling in on because this drives behavioral changes that in, in use of language and, uh, communication, um, without ever having to cross the line. Right. It is, it is a, a incredibly effective tool to generate self-censorship in behavior, thought, and speech. I think of it as the opposite of goose-stepping, right? And the idea is, look, if totalitarianism goose-stepped its way in, we'd all know exactly what it was, right? This is the opposite. It's like, it's, it's subtle enough. You've got to have a certain, you know, ability to track an argument and follow through. It's, it's boring. It, it's boring. It's so boring that you're not going to notice it. And if somebody says it's happening, you're going to want them to stop talking about it because it's it's too abstract. Right? It's insidious. It is. And it is relentless. Yeah, it is That's, relentless. It's, it's the relentless aspect that sometimes I have to um, fight um, the darkness inside myself when I encounter it. Yeah. Um, that the... 
uh, relentless denial of the data, of the facts, of the truth. Um, we're in a world, <coughs> it's, it seems hyperbole, we're in a post-truth world. Mm -hmm. Well, the truth, I mean, there is literally a memo that says if you say true things that cause people to distrust their government, you're guilty of terrorism. It is, That's where we are. It is so deeply Orwellian. It, it, it's, I think I was thinking this this morning, that it's actually a step beyond Orwell. Right. That's a. It's like they've taken 19. So I'm not, this is an original thought to me. It's as if they've taken the writings of Orwell and Animal Farm in 1984 and Brave New World and all those classic texts that you yeah. and I probably, because we're of a certain generation, we had to read when we were young humans. Yeah. Uh, and um, in our formative years, in those in those key years right before puberty most of us were had had to encounter these this logic and these thoughts and it's as if they've taken those classic works and used them as textbooks as a starting point it 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 really reminds me of uh, machiavelli's the prince mm -hmm. um, but the prince was actually written as a as a lodestone as a guide for uh the young noble in um the uh, balkanized world of uh, Italy um, uh, at, you know, with Renaissance and post-Renaissance period. And it's as if they have taken these warning texts and uh, taken them as a starting point and weaponized them.